Kuleski quickly emerges as the leader and takes on his first challenge, lifting the building materials 170 feet to the work platform above. Technologically, the means did not exist. Up until Brunelleschi's time, lifting devices were referred to generically as the rota mania, okay, or as the great wheel, which was a large wooden wheel that looked very much like a modern gerbil cage, inside of which human beings would walk, causing the wheel to turn, and as that wheel turned, it would coil a rope, okay, and that coiling would gradually then lift an object based on the lifting power of the people who were actually walking inside. Brunelleschi realizes that the old method could not be used in a project this large and a work site this high. He invents a hoist that uses oxen rather than people to raise and lower the loads. This is really Brunelleschi as the engineer, Brunelleschi as the inventor. They're turning a wheel that would turn a vertical shaft, and it in turn uh, would have a series of cogged wheels that would then interlock with other cogged wheels. And so as the oxen are moving in one direction, they could of course lift weight upward, okay? But more importantly, Brunelleschi realized we're not going to have to only lift weights up, we're going to have to lower those weights as well. And so he introduces what is the first ever reverse gear in history. Keeping the oxen moving in the same direction saves valuable time. The hoist raises or lowers material depending on which of two horizontal wheels locks into a vertical wheel on the drum holding the rope. When a load needs lifting, the bottom wheel engages, and the drum gathers rope in. When a load needs lowering, the top wheel is set in place to turn the drum in the opposite direction. By simply changing which of the wheels interlocked with the large vertical one, you could then change the direction technically of actually lifting or actually lowering of the material down to the ground. The oxen could walk all day long in the same direction, keeping materials flowing to and from the workplace above. In 3,000 years of engineering, no one had ever done that. He pushed beyond a boundary uh, that no one else had crossed. No one else had even got to that boundary. Brunelleschi crossed over it. Brunelleschi had solved the problem of lifting nearly 40,000 tons of material up to the work site. Now, the former goldsmith has an even bigger challenge, connecting eight massive walls together to form the world's largest dome. Florence holds its breath as the walls begin to rise. Around 1425, five years into the project, the bricks, by design, start to curve inward. Without a wooden framework to hold the weight, the project is entering dangerous, uncharted territory. The old methods of bricklaying would no longer work. Most walls are built by simply laying bricks along straight lines, one after another, layer upon layer. Russell Gentry, a professor of engineering at Georgia Tech, has studied Brunelleschi's methods. So Brunelleschi had built uh, the wall in the simple way you see here. You would have layers of brick and layers of mortar. And the layers of brick and layer of mortar are very simply separated by one another. And the layers of mortar represent planes of weakness through the wall. What we see here is that the wall is leaning in. Gravity is pulling it in towards me. And so a crack could form in one of the layers of mortar. The mortar is weaker than the brick. And the whole thing could rotate and all of this brick could fall in. The time had come for Brunelleschi to share part of his secret plan with the world. That's the point in the building where support of some sort was always needed. And Brunelleschi had to begin using this special pattern of laying bricks that he himself seems to have invented. In Brunelleschi's new design, horizontal bricks are interrupted by others set vertically. 
instead of continuing in one straight line, the bricks zigzag. In the area between the two domes, that pattern is visible today, but only in small patches that remain unplastered. In Italian, the design is called spina pesce, spine of the fish. English speakers call it herring. The herringbone design is even easier to spot in Massimo Ricci's dome. The pattern is simple. And it's a method the American bricklayers catch on to rapidly. They lay the vertical bricks first. These are the spines. Once the spines are set, the horizontal bricks are then wedged in between the spines, row after row. In all their years of working, the Americans have never seen bricks laid quite this way. It's completely different. The techniques are definitely, definitely way different than what we're used to. This system is pretty amazing, really. The vertical bricks in the spina pesce pattern block the mortar's planes of weakness. This prevents large sections of wall from separating or shearing and tumbling to the ground. If everything was laid uh, uh, horizontally and you just brought it in slowly each time, you would always have a shear point, a shear plane where that could slide off. Where here, you don't have any single shear point anywhere. It's all tied together a million times. is so untested at the time, Brunelleschi has had to convince the cathedral board and the workers to allow him to use it. Once again, Brunelleschi is going against convention. He's also asking his workers to trust him with their lives. They were working around about 220, 230 feet in the air, and they were literally hanging over an empty space where if they fell, it was certain death. Um, and so Brunelleschi certainly needed to have his men have faith in him. And they, they needed to believe that Brunelleschi knew what he was doing. Brunelleschi must have done something to convince the workers to trust this new method. But what? The answer may lie in a building that sits just behind the cathedral, in the very shadow of the dome. It was built as a theater in the 1800s. Many years later, it was converted into a parking garage. That's it. While renovations were going on to build a new wing of the Cathedral Museum, archaeologists dug out centuries of landfill and discovered buried treasure. What now appears to be a hole in the ground would have been a freestanding structure in the 15th century. The remains of a dome, perhaps left there by Brunelleschi himself. Professor Francesco Guglieri of the University of Florence is overseeing the discovery. Ecco qua, questa è la famosa cupolina. Here it is. This is the famous little dome. Nel novembre. It was discovered in November 2012 and it surprised the world of architecture. Tutto il mondo della cultura architettonica. The top has been lost to time, but the inward curve of the walls remains. The Little Dome's base is constructed of sandstone. The brickwork only begins a third of the way up the wall. This proportion mirrors exactly the design of the Cathedral Dome. And the brickwork is done in a herringbone pattern. I was immediately excited about it because having recognized the presence of the herringbone, I immediately connected it to Brunelleschi's technique. And do you think Brunelleschi stood here and said, this is how I'm going to do it, this is the secret? 
spilled in the dome. È molto probabile, è molto probabile. Yes, it's very probable that during the construction, Brunelleschi was here to demonstrate the use of the herringbone method. La tecnologia della spina pesce, yes, uh, I think this is uh, the model. But the new discovery features one obvious difference. It's round. While the cathedral dome appears to have eight individual walls, 